Chapter 10. The Third Voyage, Part 1. The resolution was again chosen for the voyage, and with her the discovery of 300 tons. Clark, second lieutenant in the former voyage, was put in command of the smaller vessel. Others, who had already sailed with Cook, joined this expedition, among them Anderson, surgeon and naturalist, who proved to be the most minute observer and the best linguist of the company, Lieutenant King, who afterwards succeeded to the command of the Discovery and had charge of the astronomical and nautical instruments on board the Resolution, while Mr. Bailey, who had been on the second voyage, again went out on board the Discovery as astronomer. Several of the petty officers had also sailed on the second voyage. There were more officers in proportion than was usual in a ship of the Royal Navy. The Resolution had three lieutenants, the Discovery two, and other officers in proportion. This was a practice commonly observed in long and dangerous voyages, partly with the view of easily putting down any attempt at mutiny. Cook, however, states that he brought with him officers for the special service of constructing charts, taking views of coasts and headlands, and drawing surveys of bays and harbors. An artist, Weber, went with them to make drawings of the places where they should touch. The best-known portrait of Cook is by Weber. Omai, the Tahitian, who had been brought to England in the last voyage, also went out with Cook to be landed on his native shore. He was laden with presents of all kinds. In respect of wages, the ships were put upon the establishments of sloops of war. As for the sailing instructions, they may be summed up in general terms. The commander was to find a northeast passage from the Pacific to the Atlantic if possible. He was also to get together every kind of information in geography, in tides, currents, shoals, rocks, harbors, depths, and soundings, natural productions, fruits, grains, minerals, metals, and people. He was also to take possession, with the consent of the natives, a charming touch of official hypocrisy, in the name of the King of Great Britain and Ireland, of convenient situations in such countries as may be discovered, and so on. With these instructions, and fully equipped, the expedition set sail from Plymouth Sound on July 11th. The following is the skeleton route of this voyage. February 6th, 1776. Commission to command the resolution received by Captain Cook. He went on board and began to enter men. The discovery, 300 tons, also purchased and command given to Captain Clark. May 29th. Sailed to Longreach. June 25th weighed anchor and made sail for the Downs. July 11th, sailed from Plymouth. August 1st through 4th, Tenerife. October 18th through November 30th, Table Bay. December 12th, islands discovered by Marion and Crozet, named by Cook, Prince Edward Island, Marion's and Crozet's Islands. December 24th through 30th, Kerguelen Island, Christmas Harbor Examined and Explored. January 24, 1777. Van Diemen's Land, Adventure Bay. February 10, New Zealand. February 11th through 25th, Queen Charlotte Sound. February 29th, Mangia Island Discovered and Visited. April 1st, Watia Discovered and Visited. April 4th, when New Ete discovered and visited. April 6th, Harvey's Island visited. April 13th, Palmerston Island found to be a group of small islets. April 24th, past Savage Island. April 28th, Anamango, Comango, and Falafajuca. April 29th, Anamuka, Friendly Islands. May 17th, Hepai. May 21st, La Fuga, Friendly Islands to Nearly Due South. May 22nd, Tonga Tabu. The Society Islands, including August 12th, Tahiti, September 30th, Eimeo, October 12th, Huahaine, and December 8th, Bola Bola. January 20th, 1778. 
Atui, and Onehio, Sandwich Islands. March 7th, Coast of America. April 24th, Nootka Sound. May 11th, Kays Island. June 19th, Selenmagans Islands. June 27th, Unalashka. August 3rd, Death of Anderson, Surgeon and Naturalist. July 9th, Cape Prince of Wales, most westerly point of North America, spent July chiefly in sailing about open sea beyond Bering Straits. Corporal Lydiard in Kippis, October 26th, sailed for Sandwich Islands. November 26th, discovered Maui. November 30th, discovered Hawaii. February 14th, 1779, Cook killed. August 2nd, Clark died of consumption. Gore took command of the Resolution, King of the Discovery. October 4th, 1780, arrived at the Nore. During the voyage, the Resolution lost five men by sickness, three of whom were ill at start. The Discovery lost none. The account of this voyage, from which the two captains never returned, was published in three volumes quarto, the first and second from the log-books and journals of Captain Cook, and the third by Captain King, who succeeded Captain Clark in command of the discovery. Dr. Douglas, Bishop of Salisbury, edited the work. Unfortunately, he also doctored it, and though he says in his introduction that Cook's journal was faithfully adhered to, he also owns to incorporating a quantity of matter from Anderson's journal. To prevent the possibility of mistake, the editor submitted the first two volumes to King, who is entirely responsible for the third. All that the editor has to answer for are the notes occasionally introduced in the course of the two volumes contributed by Captain Cook and the introduction. It is, however, quite clear that many portions of the work have been rewritten or touched, not, it is true, in the lumbering style of Dr. Hawksworth, but still touched. The straightforward directness and simplicity of Cook's own narrative of the second voyage are gone. The venerable and learned bishop could not understand that it was his religious duty to present the very words of the dead navigator. These given without alteration, he was at liberty to add what notes he pleased, and to enrich the work with Anderson's observations, which are certainly admirable, but not to incorporate them with the body of the work, so that the reader is dragged from Cook to Anderson, and from Anderson to Cook. The editor afterwards acknowledges also that Captain King gave advice and directions in a variety of instances when the journal required explanations. Lieutenant Roberts was also frequently consulted, and particular obligations are due to Mr. Wallace, who cheerfully took upon himself the trouble of digesting from the log-books the tables of the root of the ships. One Mr. Wegg also assisted, and the Honorable Mr. Davies Barrington, and Mr. Tennant and Mr. Bryant, who followed Captain Cook in his study. In fact, a large number of eminent hands assisted in the production of the work, and if, after so much assistance, there is still much of the original journal left, we ought to be thankful to the editor. I have before me, however, a journal of the voyage, which has never before been published, kept by George Gilbert of the Resolution. He appears to have gone out as master's mate or midshipman on board the Discovery. By the successive deaths of Captain Cook and Captain Clark, he was promoted to be lieutenant. George Gilbert's father had been master on the Endeavour during the first voyage and on the Resolution during the second. He retired from active service and lived at Fareham in Hampshire to the age of ninety-one. His son, who on the return of the expedition received promotion, died of smallpox immediately afterwards. The journal fell into the possession of the late Dr. Doran, whose wife belonged to the Gilbert family. It has been most kindly lent to me with the permission to use it for this volume by Mr. Albendoran. Many details of interest which are omitted in the official journals have been preserved in this log. I propose to follow the voyage, the route of which has been given above, with the assistance of Mr. Gilbert of the Resolution, partly because Cook's own account, as we have seen, has been so much edited, 
and partly because this narrative is at least new, while Cook's, doctored by the bishop and his friends, has been in the hands of the world for a hundred years. All the voyages of the latter half of the last century, as I have already said, lie on the borderland between the ancient and the modern. We are as yet too near the navigators of the time to feel the charm of adventure as we feel it in the voyages of Drake and Raleigh, or later in those of Dampier. They belong to a trying period in the history of a book of travel, a hundred years more, and Cook will have become, as he really was, the last of the old navigators, the successor, the last in the long list of Magellan, Tosman, Quiros, Drake, and the rest. A hundred years more, and Cook's descriptions of the Polynesians and Australians will be invaluable, as a record of things long since passed away. Even the people of the islands will have disappeared. There will not be a single survivor of the friendly islanders, or of the gentle natives of Tahiti, or of the fierce warriors of New Zealand. As for information or observation on the manners and customs of the natives, Gilbert's journal affords little or none that is new. On the contrary, his remarks concerning them are of the briefest. Evidently, he and with him the great body of the officers had no training as to the value of such observations or the method of making them. Anderson, for instance, furnishes many pages on the Tasmanians, and has put together a short vocabulary of their language. Gilbert sums them up quite in the proverbial style. They wear no clothes and are not ashamed, they know no arts, except the natives of Terra del Fuego, they are supposed to be the most ignorant race of people existing, which is quite enough attention for a British officer to bestow upon these people. Let us run through the journal and select those passages which supplement and illustrate Cook and King and throw light on the daily life and conversation of the officers and men. At Queen Charlotte Sound, the New Zealanders can hardly be persuaded to come on board, probably in fear of retaliation for the murder of the adventures men three years before. I think, says Gilbert, that nothing can be a greater proof of their treachery than their suspecting it in us. In Cook's account, we presently read that he went ashore with a party of men in five boats to collect food for the cattle. The reason for this exhibition of strength is thus given in Gilbert's log. The spelling of the gallant officer is preserved in this extract, but modernized in those that follow. A boat was sent every day to different parts of the Sound with eight or ten people to cut grass for the cattle. I was in that party, and it was lucky for us that we never met with any of the natives, for though we had arms with us, yet they might have rushed from the woods and cut us off, the ship not being able to give us any assistance. One day, when we were at Long Island, a quarrel happened at the ship with the natives, when an old man came on board and told Captain Cook that some of his countrymen had a design upon our boat. At the same time, they saw three or four large canoes full of men going over to where the boat was, sent from the ship manned and armed to bring us intelligence and see whether anything had happened. She arrived in time, for we had seen nothing of the natives, but however, we were ordered to come on board. The next day, Captain Cook made an excursion up the sound with five boats and fifty or sixty men well armed to cut grass. We went up about twelve miles and cut two boat loads. On our return we put into Grass Cove, the place where the adventure's boat's crew, consisting of a mate, a midshipman, and eight men, were cut off and et upon the spot by the natives. No place could be more favorable for such intentions, as the wood was so thick that the natives could approach close to them before they were discovered. We saw four or five of them, who, seeing our numbers, were afraid to come near us, till we made them to understand that we had no intentions to hurt them. We had reasons to believe there were a great number of them in the woods, as those with us frequently called to them. We returned to the ship that night. End of section 15「A long and pleasing account of Anamooka or Rotterdam Island is found in Cook's journal. The following sketch of the same place from Gilbert's log is equally pleasing and more enthusiastic. 
it also gives us important facts as to the provisioning of the crews on the first of may came to an anchor at anamooka so called by the natives but by tasman rotterdam this island is low and about six miles in extent with a lagoon of salt water in the middle of it and is in my opinion the most delightful spot in the world being covered with a variety of trees and bushes forming the most shady and agreeable walks i ever met with we moored here in twelve fathom water the bottom rather rocky about half a mile from a sandy beach the natives came on board in great numbers and behaved in the most friendly manner being very much rejoiced at seeing the ships again they brought on board hogs fowls and fruit in great plenty which we purchased of them for hatchets nails and beads every species of the ship's provisions was from this time stopped and we lived entirely upon the productions of the islands which was very agreeable to us sent our tents on shore and the observatories with the astronomers instruments for making observations to regulate our timekeeper had a guard of marines on shore for their protection sent the cattle on shore for some refreshments which they were much in want of being reduced very low the discovery had both her cables cut through by the coral rocks she was lucky enough to get both her anchors again after great trouble hove our cables in to examine them but found them not in the least damaged had parties on shore cutting wood and watering from a small pond about a quarter of a mile above the beach which was muddy and brackish and the only water we could get but the milk of the coconuts in a great measure made up for the badness of it as they were so plentiful we seldom drank anything else as we secured more hogs here than were sufficient for present use we began to salt pork for to carry to sea at the friendly islands gilbert gives us a little illustration of that hastiness of temper which is mentioned by all those who speak of cook's personal character the incident is not found in the journal this isle which is by far the largest in the cluster is about seven leagues in length and five in breadth it is throughout low and level with the same appearance as the others we observed part of an eclipse of the sun here the two chiefs mentioned before came with us and behaved in the most friendly manner imaginable and supplied the two ships with provisions in great plenty in all their proceeding they showed a noble generous and disinterested spirit and though their manners were rude and unpolished yet in every action they displayed an elevation of the mind that would do honour to a european in the most distinguished sphere of life played off some fireworks here which were viewed by a numerous assembly with acclamations of admiration and surprise these indians are very dexterous at thieving and as they were permitted to come on board the ship in great numbers they stole several things from us this vice which is very prevalent here captain cook punished in a manner rather unbecoming of a european namely by cutting off their ears firing at them with small shot or ball as they were swimming or paddling to the shore and suffering the people as they rowed after them to beat them with the oars and stick the boat hook into them wherever they could hit them one in particular he punished by ordering one of our people to make two cuts upon his arm to the bone one across the other close below his shoulder which was an act that i cannot account for any other way than to have proceeded from a momentary fit of anger as it certainly was not in the least premeditated on another occasion he relates an anecdote which shows the courage of the captain it also illustrates his modesty as will be seen this is what is recorded in the journal one of my people walking a very little way was surrounded by twenty or thirty of the natives who knocked him down and stripped him of everything he had upon his back on hearing of this i seized two canoes and a large hog and insisted on taufa's causing the clothes to be restored and on the offenders being delivered up to me this however is gilbert's account of the adventure one day when captain cook was on shore with a party trading for provisions having nothing with him but his hanger and a fowling piece that one of the officers had brought on shore one of our people separated from the rest 
and went up about half a mile into the country, where he was met by the natives who robbed him of everything, then ran away and left him naked. They at the same time had a very strong inclination to attack the whole party, which Captain Cook, perceiving, sent on board for arms and by a resolute and undaunted courage prevented. Gilbert's account of the friendly islanders, among whom the resolution spent between two and three months, is interesting, but adds little to what we already possess in the captain's journal. Perhaps there is a little more feeling for the sex discovered in the remarks of the younger man. Although the women have something masculine in their appearance, yet their countenances are pleasing, and their dispositions very mild and agreeable. Their dress consists only of a piece of cloth wrapped round their waist, reaching to the knees, in which they are exceeding neat and clean, as well as in their persons. They are always full of mirth and vivacity, and very fond of singing and dancing. The women here, though not so fair as in general in the society islands, yet are quite as agreeable, if not more so. Their features are regular and beautiful, their mien graceful, both in their persons and dress neat, their dispositions mild and cheerful, and their whole study and endeavor to render themselves pleasing to every one. They seem to be fonder of singing and dancing in their own mode than any girls we have ever seen, and notwithstanding there is a great degree of wantonness in both, yet it is attended with a peculiar kind of simplicity and innocence, which joined to the customs of the country entirely removes every idea that can be turned to their prejudice. In fact, so pleasing is their temper, so great their vivacity, that even a hermit could not help being delighted with them. The arrival and stay at Tahiti, which occupied many chapters in Cook and King, are dismissed by Gilbert in four or five pages. He notes the fact that the goats left on the former visit had increased in number and appeared to be thriving. He mentions the visit of the Spanish ship since their last day, on which Cook has a great deal to say. He describes the canoes of the people, and he is struck with the barbarity of the human sacrifice, at which, that is to say, at that part which came after the slaughter of the victim, Cook was present. At Eimeo happened the incident of the stolen goat, and it really would seem as if the captain on this occasion too allowed himself to be carried away by temper. First, the chief, Mahayan begged a pair of goats, which the captain thought he could not spare, unless at the expense of other lands where they might with greater advantage be put ashore. Therefore, he refused. The next day after, a goat sent on shore to graze was stolen. The goat was brought back the next day, but another, a she-goat, big with kid, was stolen on that very morning. The captain sent a boat after it, but the people pretended to send after it, and amused the petty officers in charge of the boat till the evening. Next day, according to his own account, Cook led in person a party of men across the island, while Lieutenant Williamson took three boats round to the other side in order to meet him. On the way, he called upon all the people to produce the goat, but they denied all knowledge of the animal. I set fire to six or eight houses, which were presently consumed, with two or three war canoes that lay contiguous to them. This done, I marched off to join the boats, which were about seven or eight miles from us, and on our way we burned six more war canoes. Next day he broke up, he says, more war canoes, and threatened not to leave a single canoe on the island, unless the goat was restored. In the evening, the goat was brought back. Thus ended this troublesome and rather unfortunate business, which could not be more regretted on the part of the natives than it was on mine. Now hear Gilbert's account of the same unfortunate affair. The natives, having stolen a small goat from us and not returning it on Captain Cook's demanding it back, the next morning he set out with the marines of both ships and some gentlemen in all about thirty-five people well armed and marched across part of the island in search of it. Likewise three boats were sent manned and armed round to meet him during this excursion. 
wherever captain cook met with any houses or canoes that belonged to the party which he was informed had stolen the goat he ordered them to be burnt and seemed to be very rigid in the performance of his orders which every one executed with the greatest reluctance except omai who was very officious in this business and wanted to fire upon the natives but as they were every way fled and left their all to the mercy of the destroyers none of them were killed or hurt which in all probability they would have been had they made the least resistance several women and old men still remained by the houses whose lamentations were very great but all their tears and entreaties could not move captain cook to desist in the smallest degree from those cruel ravages which he continued till the evening when he joined the boats and returned on board having burnt and destroyed about twelve houses and as many canoes part of the planks he brought away with him the next morning he went round again with three boats where he completed the devastation he had left undone the day before and all about such a trifle as a small goat which was that evening brought on board by the natives i can't well account for captain cook's proceedings on this occasion as they were so very different from his conduct in like cases in his former voyages if anything may be offered in favour of them it was his great friendship for otu king of otaheite to whom these people were professed enemies at the island of huaheine also one of the friendly group omai was left ashore gilbert's narrative of this business the landing of the two new zealanders and the affair of the two deserters shows the feeling in the wardroom on these events it was not always as has already been seen that of unmixed admiration of the captain's conduct omai though generally understood to have been brought from otaheite was in reality a native of this island and now chose to make it the place of his residence in preference to any other island in the cluster accordingly all our carpenters were set to work to build him a house of the planks of the canoes destroyed at eimeo which in about a fortnight they completed his principal furniture was a bed in the english fashion several tin pots and kettles and a hand organ on which he used to play and divert the natives he had likewise a brace of pistols and a musket for which we left him a small keg of gunpowder we also left him a horse and a mare for which he had a saddle and bridle and understood the management of them very well captain cook purchased a small space of land round his house for him from the chief and planned out a garden in which we sowed several kinds of seeds that we brought out with us and planted some vines brought from the cape of good hope and which seemed to prosper very well till they were plucked up in the night by some of the natives for which one of them was the next day brought on board had his ears cut off and was kept in irons on the quarter-deck after he had been in confinement about a week some of our people took pity on him and released him in the night so that he made his escape captain cook was exceedingly angry on this occasion but could by no means find out the person that did it end of section sixteen chapter ten the third voyage part three the two boys that we brought with us from new zealand were left here as servants to omai it is almost impossible to conceive their distress at being forced to part from us it being entirely against their inclinations to stay here as it was their earnest desire to go with us to england but that captain cook would not permit they had now become so well reconciled to us as not to have the least desire to return to their own country the oldest whom i mentioned before to be the son of a chief behaved in a manner that gained him the love and esteem of every one in all his actions he displayed a nobleness of spirit above the common rank of people and never associated with the sailors but always kept with the gentlemen he was very sensible and of a mild humane disposition and had acquired a just abhorrence of the barbarous practices of his countrymen the youngest was always full of mirth and good humour and for his mimicry and other little sportive tricks was the delight of the whole ship's company 
so great was his desire to remain with us that he was obliged to be tied down in the canoe that carried him on shore having leaped out of it once and attempted to swim back to the ship the other bore it with a becoming fortitude disdaining to ask captain cook for what he knew he would not grant they were exceedingly fond of each other and everybody was sorry to part with them omai took his leave of us in a very affectionate manner and i believe would have been very glad to come back to england but he knew captain cook would not permit it for the curiosity of the people of england having quite subsided they began to think him rather a burden on the public and were glad thus to get clear of him he was certainly as stupid a fellow as any on the island and originally of the very lowest degree therefore i make no doubt that he will in a short time be plundered of everything he has and be forced to return to his former state but i have not the least idea of their offering him any kind of violence it may be wondered why the cattle left with the king of otaheite were not in preference given to omai but the reason is very obvious for as we expect everything to be taken from him the cattle would but induce the natives to do it sooner and most probably would be the cause of great contentions among the chiefs before they could agree who were to have them and perhaps they would be destroyed to put an end to the disputes as was done in a similar case that we met with afterwards but should they not be hurt yet it is most likely that they would be divided among the chiefs and ever afterward kept separated which would equally destroy the grand object of forming a breed at these islands but now they are perfectly free from those dangers as being in possession of the principal person of this country as for the horse and mare left with omai they are not of that consequence as the cattle therefore it is no great matter what becomes of them just before we sailed captain cook particularly desired omai after we had been gone about three weeks to send a canoe to us to the island we were going to and if the natives treated him ill to send a black bead if moderate a blue one and if well a white one which advice he carefully observed after about a month's stay here we sailed for ulietea which lies eight or nine leagues to the westward and the next morning came to an anchor in ohamaneno harbour on the lee side of the island the entrance is between two reefs and very narrow warped up about two miles into a cove at the head of the harbour hauled the ship close to the shore and secured her with hawsers to the trees not being above ten or twelve fathoms from the beach this island is of a moderate height and very fertile it is larger than huaheine though small in comparison with otaheite and is partly joined by a reef of shoal water upon it to an island about four miles distant called otahare the natives here are numerous and supplied us with provisions in a very plentiful and friendly manner sent our observatories on shore as usual a few days after we had been in one of our marines who was placed as a sentinel over the observatories was found in the night to have quitted his post and gone with his musket into the country in the morning the sergeant and four marines were sent in search of him but returned in the evening without getting any intelligence of him the next morning captain cook went in quest of him with two boats armed and in the afternoon found him amongst a great number of natives a few miles from the harbour he was brought on board and punished with two dozen lashes a little time after this a midshipman and a common sailor ran away from the discovery in the night in the morning when captain cook was informed of it he went with some boats armed in search of them and had recourse to his usual practice on these occasions namely of inviting some of the chiefs on board and then confining them till the natives had made full restitution for whatever they had been guilty of which was always found to have the desired effect and was certainly the best method that could possibly be taken in these cases to avoid bloodshed being in general very easily accomplished as the chiefs usually came on board of their own accord two or three times a day for their amusement in the present case captain clark was ordered to get the son of ohan the king of the island likewise his daughter and her husband on board the discovery and confine them there 
which was accordingly done and the king was told that they should never be released till our two deserters were brought back he seemed to be greatly distressed on the occasion and immediately set about making inquiries after them captain cook returned in the evening without getting any intelligence of them the next morning he set out again but likewise returned without success therefore he went no more in quest of them but depended upon the king's bringing them back during the confinement of the princes a great number of women came round the ship and presented a very affecting scene of lamentation by tearing their hair and striking their heads with a shark's tooth that they had in each hand for that purpose till the blood ran in a continual stream from every part of it in this manner those indians express their grief when any great misfortunes befall them and in the present case there appeared to be an emulation amongst them who should carry it on to the greatest height till the scene became too moving to behold one afternoon a girl who had followed us from Aimeo informed us that the natives were then going to seize captain clark and lieutenant gore who were on shore together by way of retaliation for the confinement of their chiefs immediately the alarm was given we were all under arms in an instant some were sent on shore in quest of captain clark while others went in the boats along shore to seize all canoes and to fire upon the natives wherever they saw any to prevent them assembling together the people that went in search of captain clark and mr gore found them together before the natives had time to form an attempt which they certainly intended for three or four of them that were with captain clark all the time he was on shore strove very much to persuade him and mr gore to go into a pool of water they were standing by to bathe where all of us frequently went for that purpose which they intended to do but seeing the natives so very anxious about it they began to have some suspicion and declined it upon this they began to be rather troublesome till captain clark presented a pistol at them that he luckily chanced to have with him which kept them quiet our people coming up armed a little afterwards prevented any mischief and they returned on board safe just before the alarm captain cook who was on shore close to the ship was likewise persuaded to go and bathe at the same place which is nearly a mile distance but fortunately chanced to refuse which i think plainly proves that the natives intended to assemble there and to seize them as they were bathing and carry them off which by the timely intelligence we received was prevented without any bloodshed our two deserters were brought back after they had been away about a week they had gone over in a canoe to bola bola and from thence to a small island called tabia twelve leagues distance from hence where the natives surprised them when they were asleep and brought them on board they were kept in confinement during our stay at these islands it was well for the natives that they delivered them up so soon for captain cook would very shortly have proceeded to the greatest extremities in his power to get them back being fully determined not to suffer any person to remain here indeed had he once made a precedent of it so very flattering was every hope of the great pleasure and happiness to be enjoyed at these islands together with the many hardships we had to encounter after we left them that a great part of our people would certainly have deserted us which would effectually have put a stop to our future proceedings the natives have always been extremely anxious for some of us to stay with them and would certainly have detained the deserters and treated them with great friendship and hospitality had they not been obliged to deliver them up to release their own chiefs they bore their confinement which was that of not being allowed to go out of the captain's cabin with great fortitude and cheerfulness and seemingly without the least apprehensions of fear for their situation which was rendered so agreeable to them as circumstances could possibly admit of about three or four weeks after we had been there a canoe arrived from omai which brought a white bead which shows that he was still treated in a friendly manner it is somewhat surprising that the Indian who had his ears cut off at Huaheine for plucking the vines up in Omai's garden, and was kept in confinement on board for some time till he was suffered to make his escape, should have the confidence to appear here in public alongside the ship, 
and seemingly without the least fear of being brought on board to his former confinement. Captain Cook, who certainly must have seen him, took not the least notice of him. On leaving these islands, Gilbert, after a short account of the people and their customs, which is of course far better done by his commander and by Anderson, expresses the grief of the ship's company at leaving them. We left these islands, he says, with the greatest regret imaginable, as supposing all the pleasures of the voyage to be now at an end, having nothing to expect in future but excess of cold, hunger, and every kind of hardship and distress attending a sea life in general, and these voyages in particular, the idea of which rendered us quite dejected. There was yet, however, an interval of time before the excess of cold should begin. Meantime, they had enjoyed an eight months' respite from the ship's fare, and so long as the plantains held out and fish could be caught, they still abstained from the biscuit and the salt junk. This great supply, says Gilbert, not only refreshed and strengthened us as much as if we had just left England, but enabled us to prosecute our discoveries northward a second season, and was in a great measure a compensation for that we lost in not being able to fetch Tahiti the first time. The discovery of the Sandwich Islands completed this voyage across the Pacific from south to north. The chapter in the history, whether by Cook or by Anderson, on the islanders of the archipelago is perhaps the most curious part of the narrative. Gilbert confines himself to the immediate usefulness of the islands, which furnished yams that lasted for a fortnight after their departure. After that, we were put to two-thirds allowance of bread, and had the pork served that we had salted at the Society Islands, which lasted out the greatest part of the season and kept very good all the time. We were allowed a small quantity of sauerkraut twice a week to eat with our salt provisions. It is an excellent antiscorbutic and kept exceedingly well all the voyage. We had likewise portable soup three times a week, boiled with our peas, which was much the worst article of provisions we had on board, for they had been kiln-dried to keep them, which almost rendered them useless, for after being in the copper six hours they were very little softer than at first, and only just tinged the water they were boiled in. We found the cold to increase very fast as we advanced to the northwards, and hunger accompanying it, for our allowance of bread was very short, and we had no flour served in lieu of beef which was grown very bad. The summer of this year was spent in carrying out the main purpose of the voyage, namely the search for a northeast passage from the Pacific to the Atlantic. A good deal of time was necessarily wasted in repairing the ships for which purpose King George Sound offered an excellent natural harbor. Here they found a large number of natives, who brought skins in great quantities for sale in barter taking in exchange anything of metal but beads and cloth had no attractions for them. Gilbert, as usual, adds his little homely details. We purchased several of the dried skins of these animals from the natives, who have them in great plenty, particularly those of the land and sea beavers, but of the two, the latter is the most plentiful, the fur of which is supposed to be superior to any that is known. The most valuable articles that we used in this traffic were hatchets, saws, old swords, large knives, and blue beads, but having very few of any of them left, we supplied the want of these with pewter plates, pieces of iron hoops, old buckles, buttons, etc., and in fact anything made of iron, tin, copper, or brass. The principal motive of our procuring those skins was for clothing to secure us against the cold, for of the bear skins we made greatcoats, and with the furs lined our jackets and made caps and gloves, from which we found great comfort. And indeed we had need, for we experienced very little from our provisions, which were only just sufficient to keep us alive. End of section 17。Chapter 10 The Third Voyage, Part 4 one can hear the talk of the wardroom when this journal is read, 
they lament continually their departure from fair Tahiti. They have no word of praise for the people in these cold latitudes. They are the most filthy set we ever met with. As for the women, I don't remember that more than two or three of them came off to the ships. They were dressed nearly in the same manner as the men, and like them had the most dirty appearance imaginable, being far unlike the blooming beauties of the tropics. He says nothing at all about a very curious circumstance mentioned by Cook, which would have increased his disgust had he observed it, namely, that some of the people brought half-eaten and half-roasted human heads and hands, and offered them for sale. There is probably some mistake, as in no part of North America were the people ever cannibals. Though they were so unattractive to these poor fellows, sick with longing for the delightful fruits and soft airs and blooming beauties of the tropics, they managed to afford a certain amount of amusement. They used frequently, as they lay alongside, in their canoes, to entertain us with their war songs and a very curious kind of masquerade dance, in which they put on large wooden masks of various forms and colors, and shifted them with great dexterity. The greater part of them resembled the face of a man. The features were cut out larger, but very expressive and well executed, and represented a number of droll gestures and distortions. They had hair, eyebrows, and teeth to them, and were painted very curiously. Some of them were made to resemble the heads of wild beasts, and others that of a bird with the bill to open and shut at pleasure. The two latter ones they frequently made use of in hunting, by way of deception, to decoy those animals near them that they were in search of. The people and place occupy two long chapters very carefully put together in the history. It seems certain that Cook and Anderson, to both of whom we are indebted for these chapters, never communicated to the other officers the orderly and methodical system of research into manners and customs which they brought to their own work among the natives. In many respects, the methods recommended by modern students of anthropology might have been based upon those followed by Cook and his sagacious assistant. On leaving the Sound, the ships proceeded northward along the shore. Here the history becomes little more than a log, showing the course, the discoveries of islands, inlets, rivers, and headlands. There is not a word in Cook's journal to show that the ship's provisions were anything but abundant. It is from Gilbert that we hear of short commons and grumbling. But it must be remembered that the captain fared no better than his officers or his men. Here, says Gilbert, a boat was sent on shore with a few people to haul the seine for fish. We caught several cod alongside with hook and line, which were a most welcome acquisition to us, being almost starved with hunger. A few days later there is another welcome acquisition. Four or five small canoes came off to us with one or two men in each, and brought with them a few fresh salmon, which we purchased and heartily wished for more, these serving only to raise our desires for what we could not procure, as they did not come off to us again. Happily being becalmed off an island, they caught a great quantity of halibut, afforded us an excellent feast for four or five days. In common gratitude they named the island after the fish, and for all I know the island still bears that name. In these seas there was a great deal of fog, and the shores were still covered with snow. On August 4th, William Anderson, the surgeon and observer, died of consumption from which he had long been declining. Gilbert mentions the circumstance without any comment. The captain says of him, He was a sensible young man, an agreeable companion, well skilled in his profession, and had acquired considerable knowledge in other branches of science. The reader of this journal will have observed how useful an assistant I had found him in the course of the voyage, and had it pleased God to have spared his life, the public, I make no doubt, might have received from him such communications on various parts of the natural history of the several places we visited, as would have abundantly shown that he was not unworthy of this commendation. It seems rather cold praise, but it is a true and faithful acknowledgment of duty, and as much as could be expected of a man who loved nothing but work, 
and saw no special merit in a man's working his best. As for the observations referred to, they are, as I have already explained, incorporated in the history of Bishop Douglas. Anderson's papers were all handed over to the Admiralty, but those which concerned natural history were given to Sir Joseph Banks. Poor Anderson was fated to receive scant praise. Banks could only say of him that had he lived, he would have given to the world something that would have done him credit. This great mass of observation was incorporated with Cook's journal. Is not that creditable to Anderson? One would have liked a little more about Anderson, who interests us above all the rest of the company which followed Cook. Gilbert might have told us that he was ill. He might at least have said a word as to the way in which his death was received. But that is not a sailor's way. When a man dies, the event is recorded, and the body dropped overboard. That is all. His place is filled up, and nothing more is said. The cold and fogs met with in this part of the voyage clearly accelerated the end of Anderson. They proved trying to the whole crew, as is evident from Gilbert's journal. He gives us at this point an account of the seahorse, which shows considerable powers of observation. The details concerning the preparation of the carcass for food are wanting in Cook's account. He says, By seven o'clock in the evening we had received on board the resolution nine of these animals, which till now we had supposed to be sea cows, so that we were not a little disappointed, especially some of the seamen who, for the novelty of the thing, had been feasting their eyes for some days past. Nor would they have been disappointed now, nor have known the difference, if we had not happened to have one or two on board who had been in Greenland, and declared what animals these were, and that no one ever ate of them. But notwithstanding this we lived upon them as long as they lasted, and there were few on board who did not prefer them to our salt meat. Here now, Gilbert's account of these animals and of the delectable food they afforded. During this cold and disagreeable passage we met with great numbers of seahorses, but why they are so called I can't imagine, for they bear not the smallest resemblance to that animal. They are about the size of a large ox, and have a thick hide thinly covered with short bristly hair. Their heads are very small, and it is the only part about them that has the least appearance of a beast, the rest of the body being like a fish, the hinder parts tapering and terminating in a couple of fins about two feet long instead of feet, having likewise one upon each shoulder with which they swim faster than can be imagined, but more slowly upon the ice. They have two large white ivory teeth, like those of the elephant, projecting with a small curve downwards from their upper jaw, which are from one and a half to two feet in length and nearly parallel to each other at about five inches distance, and end in a point at the outer extremities. That they are endued with a greater share of sagacity and understanding than the generality of animals will appear from the following instance. When they went to sleep, a great number of them assembled upon a small piece of ice separated from the rest, and only just large enough for that purpose that they may the more readily get off from it into the water in case of the approach of an enemy. I believe the only one they are apprehensive of is the white bear, which is likewise amphibious, and being much nimbler upon the ice than they are, has there greatly the advantage of them. But in the water the seahorse is the swiftest and most formidable on account of its teeth. Therefore, to prevent being surprised in their sleep, they always appoint one as a sentinel, and place it in the middle to keep watch over them during that time, which charge is strictly and faithfully performed, keeping the four parts of its body erect and an attentive eye all round. As we approached them with the ships, they would lie very quiet, till we came within two cables' lengths of them, when the one that had the watch would make a great noise to alarm the rest, upon which they all began by degrees to raise their heads and shoulders and look round them, and then crawl to the edge of the ice, and plunge head foremost into the water, so that by the time we had got within half a cable's length of them, there would not be one remaining. The noise they make is a mean between the barking of a dog and the bellowing of an ox. We hoisted out our boats to get some, 
and with great difficulty killed and brought on board eight or ten of them for although we rode ever so softly yet by the time we got within good musket shot it was a great chance if there were any left and unless we fired at them upon the ice it was twenty to one that we could hit them in the water as they dive immediately they will in general bear three or four balls in their body before they are killed except in their heads and then one is sufficient their affection for their young and even for one another is very great and remarkable for wherever one of them got wounded in the water if any of the rest were near they would come to its assistance and carry it off if possible at the risk of their own lives but if by chance we had killed one of their young the mother would come and make every attempt to rescue it from us and even tried to upset the boat it was in by hooking the boat side with her teeth which she would follow till she was killed all the time making a lamentable noise and showing every sign of real parental distress after we had got them on board they were skinned and cut up by the butcher the hides we preserved for the rigging the blubber or fat we put into casks to melt down into train oil for our lamps and the flesh disgustful as it was we ate through extreme hunger caused by the badness of our provisions and short allowance which were but just enough to exist upon and were now reduced on account of this supply the quality of which will be best described in the several preparations it went through before it was possible to eat it in the first place we let it hang up for one day that the blood might drain from it which would continue to drop for four or five days when permitted to remain so long but our hunger would not allow of it at first after that we towed it overboard for twelve hours then boiled it four hours and the next day cut it into steaks and fried it and even then it was too rank both in smell and taste to make use of except with plenty of pepper and salt and these two articles were very scarce amongst us however our hunger got the better of the quality and in the quantity we found some comfort having as much of it as we could eat which was what we had been a long time unaccustomed to we salted some of it by way of experiment which after lying two or three weeks we found was a little improved but still could only be eaten by such as were at the point of perishing with hunger and where no other food was to be secured the most northerly point reached was in latitude sixty nine degrees thirty six minutes they were then in the region of the polar ice as there was but little wind the captain went out with the boats to examine the state of the ice and the manner of its formation he arrived at the conclusion since fully confirmed that it is vain to expect that these seas are ever free from ice or to believe that the sun of an arctic summer is ever strong enough to melt the ice formed in the winter i am of opinion he says that the sun contributes very little toward reducing these great masses for although that luminary is a considerable while above the horizon it seldom shines out for more than a few hours at a time and often is not seen for several days in succession it is the wind or rather the waves raised by the wind that brings down the bulk of these enormous masses by grinding one piece against another and by undermining and washing away those parts that lie exposed to the surge of the sea this was evident from our observing that the upper surface of many pieces had been partly washed away while the base or under part remained firm for several fathoms round that which appeared above water exactly like a shoal round an elevated rock thus it may happen that more ice is destroyed in one stormy season than is formed by several winters and an endless accumulation is prevented but that there is always a remaining store every one who has been upon the spot will conclude and none but closet studying philosophers will dispute the journal here resumes the baldness of a log the ship's course was southward again among the islands off alaska on one of them cook remarks we found a heath abounding with a variety of berries gilbert as usual expresses the emotions of the crew at the discovery of these berries this part of the coast which is very mountainous inland but toward the shore is of a moderate height and thinly covered with small pines this being the first wood we had seen since we had left cook's river 
it was quite a new sight to us and appeared very delightful we found hurdle and craneberries here in great plenty which proved a far more delicious treat to us than the fruits of the tropical islands being at present in much greater want of them yet we got but few as we were allowed to go on shore only for a very short time we took in some water here and a great quantity of wood the beach being almost covered with old trees and branches that had drifted upon it as we could not get any farther with the ships two boats were sent well armed under the command of mr king our second lieutenant to examine the head of the sound and discover if the land on the south side joined to this on the north we saw about twelve of the natives from whom we purchased several salmon trout which were very acceptable to us after three days we weighed and stood over to the other side of the sound which is here about seven leagues across and anchored within a bluff point that stretched a little way out and formed a small bay to the westward of it we landed and found great plenty of berries and a few currant bushes but they had no fruit left upon them we gathered great quantities of an herb that grows here to make use of in lieu of tea which has a very agreeable flavour and is the same kind that is used by the indians of hudson's bay in newfoundland among these islands and on the coast of kamchatka they fell in with russians from whom they got such information as these settlers could give and the sight of their charts it was not until the end of october that cook finally left unalashka and steered south appointing the sandwich islands as the place of rendezvous for the discovery during this voyage in the north pacific twelve hundred leagues of coast were examined and the sea traversed in many directions no other navigator had ever done so much for this part of the world yet the expedition failed in its main object and found no northeast passage on december first the resolution reached the sandwich islands once more and discovered the islands of Maui, Maui, and Ohaihi, Hawaii. Gilbert again expresses for us the satisfaction of the crew upon arriving at a place of rest and refreshment after this long voyage. The joy that we experienced on our arrival here is only to be conceived by ourselves or people under like circumstances, for after suffering excess of hunger and a number of other hardships most severely felt by us for the space of near ten months we had now come into a delightful climate where we had almost everything we could wish for in great profusion and this luxury was still heightened by our having been at a shorter allowance of provisions this last passage than ever we were at before having procured a sufficient supply to last us four or five days we stood off and worked up along shore to the southeast, keeping at the distance of five or six leagues from the land. When our stock on board began to grow short, we went close in and traded for more, and then stood off again. This we continued to do for ten or twelve days till we weathered the southeast point of the island, which is called by the natives Mowi. We have now arrived at the last act in the life of Captain Cook as regards the people who were to be his murderers almost his last words express his confidence in the natives and his satisfaction with their conduct i had never met with a behaviour so free from reserve and suspicion in my intercourse with any tribes of savages as we experienced in the people of this island it is to be observed to their honour that they never once attempted to cheat us in exchanges nor to commit a theft they understand trading as well as most people and seem to comprehend clearly the reason of our plying upon the coast we moored with stream anchor and cable to the northward unbent the sails and struck yards and topmasts the ships continued to be most crowded with natives and were surrounded by a multitude of canoes i had nowhere in the course of my voyage seen so numerous a body of people assembled at one place for besides those who had come to us in canoes all the shore was covered with spectators and many hundreds were swimming round the ship like shoals of fish we could not but be struck with the singularity of the scene and perhaps there were few on board who ever lamented our having failed in our endeavours to find a northern passage homeward last summer to this disappointment we owed our having it in our power to revisit the sandwich islands and to enrich our voyage with a discovery which though the last 
seemed in many respects to be the most important that had hitherto been made by europeans throughout the extent of the pacific ocean these are the last written words of captain cook if indeed he did write them which only bishop douglas can tell us it is singular not only that his confidence should prove so mistaken but that he should also so greatly exaggerate the importance of this new discovery what is hawaii what are all the sandwich islands together compared with new zealand and australia End of section eighteen chapter eleven his death part one the pacific which loved to kill those who rested its secrets was now to claim as a victim the great sailor who had fixed on the chart all the floating and uncertain islands seen by previous voyagers and had found so many more himself the story of his death is the most remarkable in the whole history of ocean disaster it was imperfectly told because imperfectly understood by king samwell and others who witnessed it the real explanation of the tragedy has been obtained from the people of hawaii themselves it will be found in the history of hawaii by manley hopkins hawaiian consul general let us tell the true story made possible by the traditions and recollections of the natives themselves mr hopkins states that in eighteen twenty three when mr ellis the missionary visited the island he found many still living who had been present at the murder or who remembered its occurrence i can corroborate this statement because i was myself assured of the fact by mr ellis himself somewhere about the year eighteen sixty five he not only informed me that he had conversed with men who had been present and had seen the thing done but he also gave me certain particulars concerning the murder which i unfortunately neglected to note to the best of my recollection however in hopkins book these particulars are all recorded the tale is one which the biographer would leave untold if possible but it cannot be neglected cook was killed who had shown a power of conciliation with the natives granted to no other navigator in these seas why those who first boarded cook's ships returned with astonishing reports the people on board had heads horned like the moon they carried fires burning in their mouths they ate the raw flesh of men this was the red watermelon if they wanted anything they took it out of their bodies and they voyaged as anybody could see on islands with high trees this was the report now a long time ago there lived on the island of hawaii lono the swine god he was jealous of his wife and killed her driven to frenzy by the act he went about boxing and wrestling every man whom he met crying i am frantic with my great love he instituted the athletic games known as the mahakiki in honor of his wife's memory and sailed away from the island for a foreign land ere he departed he prophesied i will return in after times on an island bearing coconut trees swine and dogs who should these strangers be but lono the great god lono come back again with his companions every one an immortal of the lesser kind when cook returned after a year's absence he first anchored in the bay of wailuhu on the northern shore of maui he arrived the day after a great battle in which the king of hawaii who had invaded the adjacent island was victorious to the victors it seemed now absolutely certain that lono himself the god of victories had come in person to add lustre to their triumph the news quickly spread all over the islands of the group when the ships anchored in the bay of kialakiakua it was in the middle of a week of taboo no ordinary avocations were to be followed no canoe must put out to sea no one must bathe no one must be seen out of doors there must be no light no fire no noise only the kings and priests descendants of the gods might move about as usual it was at one of these awful periods that cook arrived for the second time he was received in silence profound yet so strong was the belief that he was none other than lono himself 
that the taboo was instantly removed great numbers of the people went on board among them a high chief named palu and an old priest who paid divine honours to the captain throwing a red cloth over his shoulders and pronouncing a long oration how far the english understood what was meant does not appear probably they took these ceremonials as simple proofs of friendship but what followed could hardly be interpreted to mean simple friendliness or even respect the people in their anxiety to see the great god lono flocked by tens of thousands there were three thousand canoes afloat on the bay at one time when the captain went on shore heralds announced his approach and opened a way for him through the crowds as he moved the assemblage covered their faces and those nearest to him prostrated themselves on the earth in the deepest humility as soon as lono had passed the people sprang up erect and uncovered their faces the evolution of prostration and erection was found at last so inconvenient and to require so unwonted an agility that the practical-minded people found that they could best meet the case by going permanently on their hands and feet and so at last the procession changed its character and ten thousand men and women were seen pursuing or flying from captain cook on all fours this would be only ridiculous but what followed was more serious king who tells the story with all the details certainly did not understand the meaning and the importance of the ceremonies it is important also to note that neither samwell in his account of the murder nor gilbert knew anything about this wonderful function the chief koa chief and priest led cook who was accompanied by king and by bailey the astronomer to a certain morai or sacred place formed by a square solid pile of stones forty yards long twenty broad and fourteen high the top was flat and paved surrounded by a wooden rail on which were fixed skulls of sacrificed captives in the centre of this area stood a minor building of wood on the side next the country were five poles upwards of twenty feet high supporting an irregular kind of scaffold at the entrance were two wooden images and beside the poles were twelve images ranged in a semicircle they invited the captain to climb upon the scaffold and there having wrapped him in red cloth they proceeded to offer him a hog two priests performing a kind of service with antiphonal chants in honour of the god lono when the captain came down he was invited to prostrate himself and to kiss a certain idol this he apparently did without scruple he was then placed between two wooden images of other gods his face and hands were anointed with chewed coconut he drank aiao prepared by mastication and ate pork also masticated on another occasion he visited a second temple where similar ceremonies were performed and always afterwards whenever he landed a priest attended him these ceremonies according to king so far as related to the person of captain cook approached to adoration End of section nineteen chapter eleven his death part two clearly king understood nothing of the real meaning of these ceremonies but there are preserved at hawaii among the histories and traditions made in the early days when people were first encouraged to write down their recollections and legends certain documents which state positively and leave no doubt that the story told above is true that cook was taken for the god lono and that the priests paid him divine honours as lono and caused the people to bring him offerings the collection of which became very speedily a grievous tax of pigs fruit and cloth when the king came back from maui he paid a grand visit of ceremony to the ships bringing gifts he threw over lono's shoulders his own cloak adorned his head with his own helmet and placed in his hands a curious fan the insignia of royalty what did cook mean by accepting these honours the gifts of the king might have been accepted as a proof of friendship but the prostration the litany the sacrifice the kissing of the idol what could these things mean 
it seems as if he must have known that worship was intended adoration of something godlike even if the fable of the god lono was unknown to him indeed there is no indication of his knowing anything about lono who was called in king's journal orono and interpreted to mean a title of high honour we must conclude that cook's attitude showed a readiness to accept any honours provided only that they assisted in victualling his ships and promoting the success of the expedition if they chose to worship him they might the sequel proved that he would have done better to repudiate these honours two or three unfortunate incidents occurred one of the seamen died he was an old man named william watman who had served as a marine for twenty-one years after that he sailed with cook on his second voyage and though by the captain's interest he obtained admission into greenwich hospital he could not remain there but must needs follow his master on his third voyage he was buried on shore the captain reading the service perhaps it would have been better to have buried him in the sea and thus to have avoided connecting death in the minds of the natives with these strangers then there was the unfortunate business about the fence which surrounded the sanctuary this fence actually this sacred fence was demanded for fuel it was not refused nothing could be refused to lono and it was taken on board the ship with many idols attached to it or leaning against it one cannot understand the story except that cook in some blundering way conceived the idea of showing the people how powerless were their idols what should we think if some protestant using a power which had fallen to him should demand the stripping of the figures and pictures of a roman catholic cathedral then there was a quarrel about the carrying of a rudder which had been taken ashore for repairs stones were thrown about and sticks freely used perhaps in consequence of these things but probably because they were already tired of their enthusiasm and of the expense which it entailed the people had begun to show signs of impatience i could never learn king writes and this is very useful in showing how little they understood of the popular superstition anything further than that they imagined we came from some country where provisions had failed and that our visit to them was merely for the purpose of filling our bellies indeed the meagre appearance of some of our crew the hearty appetites with which we sat down to the fresh provisions and our great anxiety to purchase and carry off as much as we were able led them naturally to such a conclusion it was ridiculous enough to see them stroking the sides and patting the bellies of the sailors who were certainly much improved in the sleekness of their looks during our short stay in the island and telling them partly by signs and partly by words that it was time for them to go but if they would come again the next breadfruit season they should be better able to supply our wants we had now been sixteen days in the bay and if our enormous consumption of hogs and vegetables be considered it need not be wondered that they should wish to see us leave they sailed on february fourth seventeen seventy nine no doubt to the joy and relief of the people the great god lono gratifying as it always is to gaze upon a god had proved expensive it was hoped that a generation or two would pass before his return he took from them a great farewell present of food and cloth and in return gave them an exhibition of fireworks a week afterwards the ships came back the resolution had sprung her foremast in a gale there were no signs of welcome the king had gone away and left the island under taboo the priests however consented to receive the damaged spar and sails and to place them with a small guard of marines under special taboo but the old power was gone the people had either ceased to believe that cook was lono or which is more probable were so familiar with the appearance of the god and his companions as to revere them no longer then the marines and guard of the gear under repair did a very dreadful thing they persuaded some of the women to break the taboo and visit them in their wrath the islanders burned down their house after they had gone there was a quarrel again about getting water finally 
there was a more serious trouble about one of the discovery's cutters which was stolen no other than the chief palu himself who had been the first to welcome the return of the god stole that cutter can we imagine that he or the other chiefs and priests believed any longer in the divinity of cook and his companions such a thing as the loss of a boat was an occasion on which cook always showed great determination he went on shore himself resolved to make an example he would capture the king and take him on board his ship there to stay till the cutter was restored this was on the morning of sunday february fourteenth the native account of what followed is thus given by hopkins cook having come on shore and had an interview with kalianopu the two walked together toward the shore cook designing to take the king on board his ship and detain him there till the missing boat should be restored the people seeing this and having their suspicions already roused thronged round and objected to the king's going further his wife too entreated that he would not go on board the ships kalianopu hesitated while he was standing in doubt a man came running from the other side of the bay crying it is war the foreigners have fired at a canoe from one of their boats and killed a chief on hearing this the people became enraged and the chiefs were alarmed fearing that cook would put the king to death again his wife canona used her entreaties that he would not go on board and the chiefs joined with her the people in the meantime arming themselves with stones clubs and spears the king sat down and captain cook who seemed agitated began walking toward his boat whilst doing so a native attacked him with a spear cook turned and with his double-barreled gun shot the man who struck him some of the people then threw stones at the englishman which being seen by his men in the boats they fired on the natives cook endeavoured to stop the fighting but on account of the noise he was unable to do so he then turned to speak to the people on shore when some one stabbed him in the back with a paloa or dagger and at the same time a spear was driven into his body he fell into the water and spoke no more samwell and king agree in the main with this account in the fight the englishmen appear to have behaved with great courage especially phillips and roberts there was one exception the lieutenant commanding the launch drew his boat off the shore had he joined roberts samwell thinks that the catastrophe might have been avoided he said himself in defence that he mistook his orders footnote this officer was afterwards tried for cowardice at the battle of camperdown and cashiered and footnote that he was not charged with cowardice is said to have been due to the weak health of clark who shrank from a measure so extreme and was physically unable to examine into the question let us now give gilbert's narrative if only to show how the tale was told by those of the expedition who knew nothing of the god lono or the adoration and were not eye-witnesses of the murder from hence we stood over to a large island called owaii that lies in sight of it to the southwest which we made on the northeast side it is very mountainous inland and the shores in general steep but exceeding fertile the natives came off to us in great numbers and behaved in a very friendly manner we traded with them as usual till we had purchased provisions enough for five or six days which we did in three or four hours and might have got three times as much if we had chosen for the greatest part of their canoes were obliged to return to the shore with what they had brought off to us we then stood off about five or six leagues from the land and worked up along shore to the south-east keeping at that distance till our stock was expended and then went in and traded for more as we had done off the other island as we were not yet in want of water captain cook preferred this method of passing the time to going into a harbour as it was a great means of saving trade of which he was very apprehensive we should not have as much as we might have occasion for the discovery having broken an arm off one of her bower anchors at the island of desolation the armourers were employed while we lay in samgonota harbour in working it up for that purpose which was proportionably divided betwixt the two ships and with several spare iron stores principally belonging to the shallop served us for trade during our stay among the islands after standing off and on for upwards of a month 
and having coasted along near two-thirds of the island we began to be in want of water therefore the master with two boats well armed was sent inshore to look for a harbour and very luckily found a small bay opposite to us which was the first we had seen the least appearance of but however as this could not be perceived till we came within two miles of it we very probably might have passed others of the same kind the next morning being about the tenth of january seventeen seventy nine we stood in for it with a light breeze and as we approached near the shore we were surrounded with upwards of one thousand canoes at the mean rate of six people in each and so very anxious were they to see us that those who had none swam off in large numbers and remained alongside in the water both men women and children for four or five hours without seeming tired the decks both above and below were entirely covered with them so that when we wanted to work the ships we could not come at the ropes without first driving the greatest part of them overboard which they bore with the utmost cheerfulness and good nature jumping from every part of her into the water as fast as they could appearing to be much diverted at it and would come on board again when the business was over this bay is situated on the west side of the island in latitude nineteen and a half degrees north and longitude two hundred and four degrees east and is called by the natives carnacoa it is small and open to the sea which causes a great swell to set in and a great surf breaking on the shore renders the landing rather difficult the bottom of it is a high steep cliff but the sides are low and level with a town upon each at least eight times as big as any we had seen before in the south sea the country here is one entire plantation as far as we could see from the ship which is divided into squares by stones thrown together or hedges of sugar-cane we moored with the bowers in ten fathom of water gravel bottom about two-thirds of a mile from the town on the north side and one-third from a low sandy beach on the south side near the bottom of the bay which is the only one in it End of section twenty chapter eleven his death part three we got our observatories and tents on shore here as usual and pitched them upon a large oblong piece of ground walled round with stones two or three feet high which was held sacred by the natives who notwithstanding their curiosity so great was their superstition that none but the chiefs dare venture to come upon it so that our people were less disturbed by them the sailmakers were sent on shore with the greatest part of our sails to repair they being now very much worn as was our rigging which we carefully overhauled here we were surrounded every day with a great number of canoes and supplied by the natives with provisions in the most plentiful and hospitable manner imaginable the king of the island whose name was teriabu and several other very powerful chiefs frequently came on board to visit captain cook who always received them with the greatest respect and they generally brought with them a large present of hogs fowls fruit etc for which he gave them in return at different times four or five small iron daggers about two feet and a half long in form of their own wooden ones and made by the armourer for that purpose likewise such other trinkets as they were pleased with what one was most in want of here was good water that which there is being in standing pools and very muddy and brackish except some we got from a small spring in a well at the foot of a rock close to the beach which yielded very little and though it was clear and much better than the other yet was rendered brackish from its being so near the waterside we purchased not less than ten or twelve puncheons of excellent salt here which is principally made by the sun and was the first we met with during the voyage this proved a very welcome supply as it enabled us to salt down pork for sea which otherwise we could not have done having used all we had on board for that purpose at otaheite one of our seamen died here whom we interred on shore in one of their burying places captain cook read prayers over him in the usual manner and the natives who were present on the occasion according to their custom threw a couple of small pigs and some fruit into the grave which was covered up with him 
The latter part of the time we lay in Matavai Bay and Otahaite, and at Amsterdam, one of the friendly islands, being five weeks at each, we found supplies of all kinds began to grow scarce. But that was far from being the case here, for everything was as plentiful the last day as when we first came in. Having got everything off from the shore, in the evening about seven o'clock, we perceived the house to be on fire that our sailmakers had worked in, which we were in general of opinion they did on purpose through some superstitious notion they had among them. It being now about the 4th of February, and the season approaching, after a stay of near a month, we sailed from the bay with an intention of going to the westward, to those islands we had been at before, to take in a supply of yams for sea, as they had got none here. But in this we were unfortunately prevented, for after working up along shore to the northward, a considerable distance against a very strong breeze, we discovered a spring in the head of our foremast right athwart from one cheek to the other, which obliged us to put back to Carriacoke Bay to repair it, and having a fair wind for it, we got in next day and moored as before. We immediately began to unrig the ship as far as was necessary, and having raised a pair of shears with two main topmasts, we got out the foremast, which was hauled up upon the beach to be repaired, and the carpenters of both ships were sent on shore for that purpose. The place our tents were pitched upon before, being close to the beach, we set them up again on the same spot, for the people who were at work upon the mast, and Mr. King, our lieutenant, was ordered to superintend this duty with a guard of about eight marines for their protection. The observatories were likewise sent on shore with the astronomical instruments and several of our sails to repair, having split them while we were out. The natives did not appear to receive us this time with that friendship that they had done before. Our quick return seemed to create a kind of jealousy amongst them with respect to our intentions, as fearing we should attempt to settle there and deprive them of part if not the whole of their country. This idea Captain Cook took every method to remove, by telling and showing them the reason that obliged us to come in again, with which they apparently seemed to be very well satisfied. The third day we had been here in the afternoon, one of the natives on board the Discovery stole a pair of tongs from off the armorer's forge, and got into his canoe with them. The alarm being given, several of them began to paddle away as fast as they could. Upon this, the master with a midshipman and two men, instantly got into their jolly boat, and without any arms pursued the canoe they suspected, which reached the shore long before them, and the men had got out and hauled it upon the beach, where several others were lying. The master and midshipmen landed amongst a great number of the natives, and were going to seize one of the canoes, when a chief who was present told them that it belonged to him, and they should not have it, and indeed it is very probable but they mistook the one the man got into who committed the theft, either in putting off from the ship among so many, or in hauling up, but as they still foolishly persisted in attempting to take it away, the chief laid hold of them, and gave them a severe beating with his hands, which the two men who remained in the jolly boat perceiving they rowed off to a little distance and got clear. Our pinnace that was lying not far off waiting for Captain Cook, with only the crew in her, who, seeing the affair, went without any orders to their assistance. But as soon as they came near the shore, the natives laid hold of the boat, and hauled her up high and dry upon the beach, and broke some of the oars, which obliged the crew to take to the water and swim to the jolly boat, the Indians at the same time pelting them with stones. In a little time they were quiet, and called to the people in the boat to come on shore, and that they would let them have the pinnace, which they did, with the oars that remained, and likewise released the master and midshipmen. About an hour afterwards Captain Cook, hearing of the quarrel, was very angry, and gave our people a severe reprimand for their rashness. He walked round with one of the officers to the place where it happened, and found everything there very peaceable. The next morning, which was the 14th of February, 1779, at daylight, 
the discovery found her six-oared cutter missing that had been moored at the buoy which we immediately supposed to have been stolen by the natives in consequence of the above quarrel when captain cook was informed of it he ordered a boat from each ship well armed to row off the mouth of the bay to prevent the canoes from going out and if any attempt it to seize and send them in again at the same time proposed to captain clark for him to go on shore and endeavour to persuade the king to come on board that we might confine him till the boat was returned according to his usual custom in these cases but he seemed to express a desire to decline it on account of his health captain cook said no more about the matter but went himself with three boats namely a six-oared pinnace in which he had with him a mate the lieutenant of marines and some of his men a six-oared launch with the third lieutenant a mate some marines and a few additional seamen and a four-oared cutter with a mate and the midshipmen that rowed her being in all including the crews of the launch and the pinnace about thirty-eight people with each a musket a cutlass and cartridge boxes having landed at the town on the north side of the bay with a lieutenant of marines a sergeant corporal and seven private men he ordered the boats with the rest of the people to lie off a little distance and wait for him he then proceeded with the marines under arms up to the king's house which was about two hundred yards from the water side where he found him with several chiefs and not less than two or three thousand of the natives after the usual ceremonies had passed the captain invited him to come on board which at first he absolutely refused but after being pressed for some time he seemed inclinable to consent and it was thought he would have come had he not been prevented by the chiefs who would not permit him as in all probability they saw into the design this enraged captain cook very much as he was not accustomed to have his intentions frustrated by any person and had but little command over himself and his anger at this instant a canoe came over from the other side of the bay and brought the natives intelligence that a chief was killed there by one of our boats firing on shore upon this they began to arm themselves with spears and pieces of the branches of trees that they broke up in a hurry instead of clubs and some of the chiefs had the same iron daggers that we had given them the captain had with him a double-barrelled piece one loaded with small shot the other with ball and a hanger by his side they now began to press together and grew rather tumultuous and some in particular insulting him he beat them with the butt end of his musket which caused them to be still more so mr phillips the lieutenant of marines perceiving this repeatedly told captain cook of the danger he apprehended they were in and urged him to retire which as if fate had determined he should fall he took not the least notice of but fired at one of them with small shot and wounded him and a little afterwards at a chief with ball but missing him killed the man that stood next to him outright and although this enraged them to the highest degree yet they then did not dare to attack him at last finding it was impossible to accomplish his design he ordered the marines to retreat and was himself following them and possibly would have got safe off had not the people in the boats very unfortunately on hearing the second report of his musket begun to fire upon the natives which threw them into a state of fury the marines likewise on shore without orders followed their example and captain cook had no sooner got to the waterside and waved to the boats to give over firing when one of the chiefs more daring than the rest stepped behind and stabbed him betwixt the shoulders with an iron dagger another at that instant gave him a blow with a club on the head by which he fell into the water they immediately leaped in after him and kept him under for a few minutes then hauled him out upon the rocks and beat his head against them several times so that there is no doubt that he quickly expired the marines likewise at the same time after they had discharged their pieces were closely attacked and not being able to load again the corporal and three private men that could not swim were seized and killed upon the spot 
the lieutenant sergeant and the other four leaped into the water which was four or five feet deep close to the rocks and escaped to the pinnace which was lying within thirty yards of the shore but by reason of the continual showers of stones that were thrown at them and the confusion of those people getting in they could not afford the least assistance to captain cook and very narrowly escaped from being taken the launch that lay close without her and the cutter that was in shore at a little distance both kept up a brisk fire for the space of ten or fifteen minutes till they were obliged to retire having killed and wounded several of the natives and caused the greatest part of them to retreat and we were informed by the gentlemen in the cutter who were the last that left the shore that very few of them remained by the dead bodies when the launch and pinnace came away during the firing on shore we saw a great number of the natives running away up an adjacent hill at whom we fired five or six shot from our great guns but our first lieutenant would not allow of any more when on the return of the boats informing us of the captain's death a general silence ensued throughout the ship for the space of nearly half an hour it appearing to us somewhat like a dream that we could not reconcile ourselves to for some time grief was visible in every countenance some expressing it by tears and others by a kind of gloomy dejection more easily to be conceived than described for as our hopes centred in him our loss became irreparable and the sense of it was so deeply impressed upon our minds as not to be forgot such was the confusion of the people when they came on board that they did not perceive till a quarter of an hour afterwards how many of the marines were missing mr phillips the lieutenant who behaved with great prudence and courage received a large wound upon his shoulder by a spear and one of the private men was wounded in his cheek close below his eye two inches and a half of the point of a spear having broken short off and was buried in his head the others had several bruises from the stones that were thrown at them but suffered no hurt of any consequence during this our people on the south side of the bay under the direction of mr king the second lieutenant were very fortunately reinforced by some of our boat's crew that had been rowing off the mouth of the bay before any disturbance had begun there being then altogether about twenty-four in number though not above two-thirds of them had muskets on perceiving they were likely to be attacked they took possession of a burying place that lay near them which was a large platform of earth thrown up and fenced with stones being about a hundred and fifty yards in length sixty in breadth and the sides six or eight feet perpendicular all round except a small passage where not more than two people could go up abreast nothing could be more conveniently situated than this place as from thence they could not only protect the masts tents and observatories which lay between them and the beach and within less than a musket shot but were secure from an encounter that they would not have been able to resist the natives did not venture either to make an open effort to force them from their post or to come near the tents but kept up a distant and vigorous attack by heaving a great number of stones from behind the trees and houses which lay behind them by creeping along under cover of these walls they were able to approach very close to the platform without being seen and when they thought themselves near enough would stand up and heave several stones and then retire for more this they continued for some time and when any of them fell another of them would step forth and carry off the body at the risk of his own life these indians use a large thick mat which they hold before them by way of a shield against their own wooden spears and at the beginning of the attack several of them came to the edge of a pool within reach of the shot to dip them in the water and then would hold them up in defiance thinking by that means to quench the fire of the musket by which they supposed they were killed but in that point we quickly undeceived them the discovery lying nearest over to this side fired several shot on shore which terrified them very much after two or three hours they retired with the loss of six or eight killed and some wounded finding it vain to carry on anything further against our people in their present situation and thinking i suppose by that means to draw them from it 
but they wisely kept possession of their post. About two hours after the death of Captain Cook, we went with all the boats from both ships well manned and armed, and brought them off with the mast and everything else we had on shore very safe, the natives not daring to molest us. The remainder of the forenoon we were employed in getting the mast upon the booms for the carpenters to work at, they having done very little to it as yet. Captain Clark now came on board and took the command of the resolution, and appointed Mr. Gore, our first lieutenant, to that of the discovery, and Mr. Harvey, one of the mates, to be lieutenant in his room. In the afternoon, notwithstanding what had passed, two of the natives from the town on the north side of the bay had courage to come alongside, which was placing great confidence in us, and proves the high opinion they entertain of our integrity. One of them was a priest, whom we had often before known to have behaved very treacherously, therefore supposed in the present case that he had no good intentions toward us, and so highly were our people exasperated at the sight that it was with great difficulty the officers could prevent their firing at him. After staying about a quarter of an hour, he returned to the shore and continued to make these short visits on board every forenoon and afternoon for three or four days afterwards, which I believe was to see whether or not we were making any further preparations against them. Mr. King, now our first lieutenant, was sent off to the town on the north side with all our boats well manned and armed to treat with the natives for the bodies, carrying a white flag as a signal of peace for that purpose. They were assembled along the shore in great numbers with their weapons in their hands and bidding us defiance in the most contemptuous manner imaginable, for they seemed to pride themselves very much in having killed our principal chief. But from what we afterwards learnt, they had very little reason, having lost not less than eight or ten chiefs and about twenty common men, besides several wounded, amongst whom chanced to be the greatest part of those who assisted in the murder of our people. They strove much to persuade us to land, but without effect. One of them was dressed in Captain Cook's jacket and trousers, and another had his hanger in his hand, which he kept shaking at us and making use of every threatening and insolent gesture he could possibly invent. This enraged the sailors to the highest degree, and it was with the utmost difficulty they were restrained from firing upon them. Finding we would not come any nearer, two of them ventured to swim off to us, whom we informed that we had no intentions of making an attack, but came only to demand the bodies, which to amuse us for the present they said were carried away some distance into the country, that we could not have them then, but promised to bring them off to us in the morning. Therefore, perceiving they were not to be procured at that time, the boats returned on board. We were rather apprehensive that they intended to make an attack upon the ships in the night, therefore took every necessary precaution to prevent being surprised, by keeping our guns and swivels loaded, and sentry forward, abaft, and on each gangway, one-third of the people always under arms, and a four-oared cutter, well-armed, constantly rowing round us at a little distance while it was dark, which both ships continued to do during our stay here. End of section 21chapter eleven his death part four the next morning the seamen earnestly solicited the captain that they might go on shore with their arms to revenge the death of their old commander which he did not think proper to permit as it was not the intention of the officers to pursue measures of that kind for a quarrel we had principally brought upon ourselves but perceiving they were very eagerly bent upon it he framed an excuse to pacify them for the present, by telling them he could not possibly think of allowing it whilst the ships remained in such a defenceless state, but that in two days' time, when we had got things into a little order, they should have leave for that purpose. By keeping them thus in suspense for three or four days, their rage began to abate, and it is well he did, for had he at first positively denied them, so highly were they incensed against the natives that I believe the officers would not have been able to have kept them on board. 
being rather suspicious that they were assembling canoes round the north point of the bay a boat with an officer was sent to sea who found no appearances of any the forenoon a canoe with three men in her came off from the north side about halfway to the ship where they stopped and began to throw stones toward us in which they could not heave half that distance they could not have any other intention but that of insulting of us one of them all the time very triumphantly kept waving captain cook's hat over his head till some muskets were fired at them and then they instantly put back to the shore our chief object at present was the foremast which the carpenters of both ships were working upon with the utmost expedition making new cheeks for it out of a spare anchor stock in the afternoon seeing a great number of the natives assemble upon the shore on the north side of the bay we fired a few shot at them from our great guns which quickly dispersed them when the old priest came on board we inquired of him concerning the bodies but could get no satisfactory account of them and when we asked him why they were not brought off agreeable to the promise made yesterday he said that they had been carried to different parts of the island and were not yet collected together but that we should have them the next day which we perceived was only an excuse to keep us quiet therefore gave over every hope of having them returned as judging that they had otherwise disposed of them and did not wish us to know in what manner on the sixteenth nothing remarkable happened till about nine o'clock in the evening when some people were discovered paddling very softly to the ships it being quite dark and not knowing how many there might be two or three of the sentries instantly fired at them nevertheless they persisted coming toward us and finding there was only one small canoe we suffered her to come alongside when to our great astonishment they proved to be two of the natives who had brought with them about five pounds of human flesh which they told us was captain cook's and that they were sent by a priest that lived on the south side of the bay who had before always treated us with great hospitality we learnt that he and his adherents still remained firmly attached to us but were too few to declare it to their countrymen which was the reason of their coming in the dark that it might not be known after giving them some presents they returned to the shore having luckily escaped being hurt in approaching the ship this small remains of our unfortunate commander which appeared to have been taken from the inside of his thigh was all our friend could procure for us and a great proof of his sincerity but answered no good purpose to us as the sight of it struck every one with horror and tended only to disquiet the sailors by renewing their desire to be revenged of the natives which began to wear off beginning now to be greatly in want of water we were necessitated to go on shore again at all events and endeavour to get off a sufficiency to last us to some other place accordingly in the morning of the seventeenth we sent the two launches full of casks to a small well before mentioned on the south side close above the beach with other boats manned and armed to protect them the discovery also hauled close in for that purpose we had not been long ashore before the natives began to annoy us by throwing stones from behind the houses and the well being situated at the foot of a steep hill they kept rolling large ones down from the top of it which were often near doing us much mischief to prevent this in a great measure it was determined by the officers to set fire to the adjacent houses which would not only terrify them but hinder their approaching to molest us as they then would have no shelter from our muskets therefore when the people went on shore again after dinner several of them were given port fires for that purpose when it was amazing with what alacrity they carried this scheme into execution the eagerness with which they grasped at this small opportunity for revenge being so great that the officers could not keep them in the least order for they all instantly separated and were guided only by their own impetuosity setting fire to the houses and killing the natives wherever they met with any who were struck with such terror at seeing the flames that they made off as fast as they could and it was very fortunate that they did 
for our people were so much scattered that had they made the least resistance they might have cut several of them off and the rest of us know nothing of it till this business was over which was in about an hour when with great difficulty we collected the people together and stopped their further progress during this they had burnt about thirty houses and had killed six of the natives two irishmen concerned in the affair extended their malice even to the dead bodies by cutting the heads from two of them which they brought down and fixed upon the stems of the boats while the houses were yet blazing we perceived a party of them coming down the hill but upon some of our people firing a few muskets at them they immediately fell flat on the ground and lay still for about five minutes they then got up and advanced slowly towards us with white flags in their hands and finding they were not very numerous we suffered them to approach us when they proved to be our friend the priest whom i mentioned last with some of his followers coming to entreat for peace for himself and his people his house being unknown to us was unfortunately burnt with the others we carried him on board the ships where we consoled him in the best manner we could and made him several presents being well convinced of his sincerity to us when the natives that came down the hill perceived the two bodies lying without their heads they set up a most frightful cry followed with great lamentation seemed to be more affected at that than anything we had done to them which must arise entirely from superstition i cannot proceed without mentioning an instance of remarkable courage in one of these indians who had for some time greatly annoyed the waterers by throwing stones at them from behind the rocks at last being closely pursued by several of our people he retreated to a deep narrow cave and immediately began raising a small breastwork of stones toward the bottom of it behind which he placed himself they searched all around but to no purpose and it is a doubt whether they would have found him or not had not he discovered himself by throwing stones at them the instant they appeared upon this three or four of them stepped to the entrance of the cave and presented their muskets at him and at the same time made signs and told him that if he would come out he would not be hurt when like aeneas he returned an answer with a flying stone which was followed by others as fast as he could throw them they then fired at him five or six times at which he seemed to be not in the least intimidated still persisting in throwing at them but perceiving that he was much wounded and resolved to fight to the last moment one of them rushed in upon him clapped a pistol to his breast and instantly dispatched him on examining him we found he had received no less than four balls in different parts he was a tall well-made handsome young man and had the appearance of a chief we took one of the natives prisoner that was attempting to escape in his canoe whom we bound hand and foot and put him into a boat that had the head of one of his countrymen on the stem of it in the evening the boat returned on board having got a sufficiency of water to last us to towy one of the other islands where we knew we could get plenty the officers would not permit the seamen to bring the two heads into the ship but obliged them to throw them into the water alongside the prisoner being brought upon the quarter-deck and set down bound as before everybody thronged round him as usual in such cases when it is scarce possible to conceive how strongly every sign of fear was imprinted in his countenance he was seized with a most violent trembling from head to foot his complexion which was naturally of a light copper was changed to that of a pale lead colour and he remained silent and immovable his apprehensions of death in every horrid form appeared to be so strong as not to admit of the least ray of hope in his relief and entirely deprived him of the faculty of speech by his looks which expressed the most exquisite distress he seemed to implore for mercy in a manner so affecting that it excited pity in every breast and all being desirous for it we unbound him he now thought we were going to put into execution what his fears had suggested and when we returned him his canoe and told him that he might go on shore he paid no attention to it for some time imagining we did it only to insult him in his misery 
by tantalizing him with what he had too great a dread upon his mind to believe but when he found we were in earnest his excess of joy was then as predominant as his fears had been before and his gratitude which he expressed in the sincerest manner was not disguised under the veil of politeness but flowed from the heart free and uncorrupted he had not been long on shore before he came off again with his canoe loaded with whatever he could procure as a present to us for which in return we gave him something of equal value this he continued to do two or three times a day and became a most faithful friend on the nineteenth the carpenter having finished the mast after great difficulty it was got in the hawser we had reeved for that purpose being so rotten that it stranded in five or six places as we were heaving and we had no better on board on the twentieth in the morning a chief that we had not seen before came on board to negotiate a peace with us and promised to restore part of the captain's body accordingly in the afternoon captain clark with three or four boats well armed went close in shore on the south side where he concluded a peace with that chief and brought on board captain cook's head and hands which were all the remains we could possibly procure the head was too much disfigured to be known but one of the hands we were well assured was his from a wound he had formerly received in it which made it remarkable one of the natives brought about a handful of small human bones which he said belonged to the marines whom they had burnt we made several inquiries to know if they ate them but could not find the least reason to believe so for they seemed to express as great an abhorrence of such an act as any european they told us that no part of captain cook was burnt but what became of the remainder of his body we could not learn they also brought off the double-barreled piece he had with him when he was killed but they had entirely spoiled it by beating the barrels quite flat at the muzzle we could never get the least intelligence of the cutter that was stolen which was the first cause of this unfortunate affair on the twenty first some of the natives from the south side of the bay brought off provisions and began to trade with us as usual but excepting the old priest we were seldom visited by any of those on the north side who did not seem so much inclined as the others to come to a reconciliation yet from every appearance i make no doubt had we remained there but that in three or four weeks we should have been nearly upon as friendly terms with them as we were at our first coming in the afternoon we buried the remains of our much lamented commander alongside with every ceremony due to his rank whose name will be perpetuated to after ages and ever stand foremost on the list of british navigators on the twenty second the ship being rigged again and ready for sea in the morning we sailed out of the bay having no desire to stay any longer at a place where we had suffered so great a misfortune thus ended ingloriously and as the result of an ill-advised attempt at high-handed justice the life of the greatest navigator of any age i think there can be no doubt that the attack on cook was rendered possible by a strong revulsion of feeling as regards his real character king priests and chiefs were perhaps by this time ashamed of their own credulity though certainly still afraid of the captain and his men that they showed human passions and emotion ate fiercely drank freely and made love would by no means detract from their divinity quite the contrary the god of the islanders was as much a god of animal parts and passions as the god of many people much more highly civilized neither king nor priest contemplated the murder of cook but among such people a quarrel soon leads to a fight and in a fight somebody naturally gets killed on the other hand one does not know perhaps it may have occurred to some native humorist such things have been done to wonder how a god would look and behave with a spear struck right through him cook was dead in this journey he explored the unknown part of the north american coast from latitude forty three degrees north to latitude seventy degrees north that is to say for thirty five hundred miles he proved the proximity of the continents of asia and america passed the straits between them and surveyed the coast on each side to such a height of northern latitude 
as to demonstrate the impracticability of a passage in that hemisphere from the atlantic into the pacific ocean either by an eastern or a western course in short if we except the sea of amur and the japanese archipelago which still remain imperfectly known to europeans he has completed the hydrography of the habitable globe footnote king's journal he may be forgiven a little exaggeration cook was not the first sailor in those seas nor did he discover the straits and the impossibility of a northwest passage was not quite proved and footnote end of section twenty two chapter twelve the end of the voyage when such of the remains of their captain as could be recovered had been buried it was alongside and not on shore with every ceremony due to his rank captain clark put out to sea and the voyage was resumed the remaining history of the expedition told admirably by captain king seems like the last act of a play whose hero has disappeared briefly they spent the summer off the coasts of Kamchatka, and in October steered a course for home by way of Japan, Macau, and the Narrow Seas. In August, Captain Clark died of consumption after a long and languishing illness. He was succeeded by Captain Gore, and Lieutenant King was appointed to the discovery. Gilbert was transferred to the resolution with King. He does not say in what capacity. In arriving off Macau, all the gentlemen were ordered to hand over their journals, charts, drawings, and observations of all kind taken during the voyage, and a diligent search was made amongst the sailors for anything they had jotted down. This was by order of the Admiralty, and in order to prevent the scramble for publication, which experience had even then shown to follow after every such expedition if the admiralty had possession of everything written and noted by their officers nothing except in general terms could be published while the drawings and observations of all kinds being reserved no scientific value whatever could attach to vague narrative one is here faced by a certain uneasiness respecting the journal from which so much has been taken it is certainly written from copious notes and it was certainly written after the voyage because the author in more than one place shows that he is arranging his notes and reserving certain remarks for a second visit to the place which he is partly describing did mr gilbert then give up everything as the admiralty ordered or which is certainly possible did the admiralty return him and other officers their journals after the official publication it matters very little but the question insists on being put on reaching the channel they met with winds so contrary that captain gore took the ships along the west coast of ireland and anchored at stromness in the orkneys here he sent captain king to london with all the papers and reports and after being detained a month at orkney was able to sail for london it is melancholy to remark that on this the very last bit of the voyage two more of the resolution men died on october seventh seventeen eighty we lashed along the sheer hulk at woolwich thus ended this voyage long and eventful which failed in its primary object yet succeeded in so many others the passage from ocean to ocean was not to be discovered for eighty years to come when it was discovered it proved to be useless the world for three hundred years had been looking for a thing which was there all the time and could be put to no practical purpose it is the history of a good many human enterprises we seek st brendan's island we look for terra australis incognita and we find new zealand and cape horn the continent of australia and the great pacific ocean studded with islands as the firmament is studded by the stars end of section twenty three chapter thirteen the ship's company we can learn more about the individual officers and men belonging to cook's three expeditions than would be expected by reading the journals of the voyages cook himself tells us nothing of his officers except in connection with special service 
when he is always ready to give them credit. There are no private letters preserved, for the simple reason that it is no use writing letters when there is no post. We cannot ascertain the grumblings of the foxhole or the criticisms of the wardroom, but something may be recovered from the journals themselves, and there was, as we have seen, the narrative of George Forster and the journal of Gilbert. Also, there are the books of Ellis, Sidney Parkinson, the draftsman brought by Banks, and one or two more, from reading which one acquires some knowledge of the officers. In general terms, Cook makes known his solicitude for the welfare of his crew. He tells us how, directly they got into cold weather, he had the sleeves of their jackets lengthened with bays and gave them caps made of the same warm material. He dilates on the grand anti-scorbutic effects of his malt, his sauerkraut, and his portable broth. He prides himself on his preservation of the crew from scurvy. We have seen how he made a kind of tea for the men from the leaves and twigs of the spruce, how he had celery and scurvy grass boiled in the peas and wheat, though the men at first would not eat them, how he made beer out of the sugar cane, and when the men refused it, knocked off their grog. We see how he sends out the young gentlemen on shooting parties, and allows them to accompany the scientific men on their botanical expeditions we cannot but remark how careful he is to mention any officer who does any special service, and when he loses his surgeon, William Anderson, it is not a formal entry in the log that records his death, but a careful tribute to his worth and his attainments that shows his justice and his desire to give to every man the credit due to his zeal and knowledge. But when the ship's beef is so rank that it can no longer be eaten, even by the strongest stomach, when the biscuit is half-eaten and wholly defiled by the cockroaches, when the crew is weakened by privation and bad food, when half the ship's company are down through having eaten poisonous fish, the captain says nothing. These things were part and parcel of such a voyage. Those who cannot endure them had better not come a-sailing on the broad Pacific." sufficient happiness for them to escape the dreadful scurvy and to come home again at length alive. Once or twice, it is true, he mentioned things which have reached a pass beyond any previous experience. We learn, for instance, on one occasion, how the ship was pestered with cockroaches, whose number could not be kept down. They swarmed everywhere. At night, they made everything in the cabin seem to be moving about by their multitudes. They devoured the ink on labels and letters. They even climbed up into the rigging, and when the sails were unfurled, they fell in thousands on the deck. The surgeon, Mr. Anderson, discovered that there were two kinds, the Blada Germanica, a daylight companion, and the Blada Orientalis, their joy by night. But this discovery brought no comfort to the crew, as it could not help to get rid of them and the cockroaches, although named and classified, went on multiplying. Again, certain fish, the captain says, which were eaten by the officers and the petty officers, caused a violent pain in the head and bones, with a scorching heat of the skin and a numbness in the joints. It was a week or ten days before all the gentlemen recovered. Forster's account of the same misfortune shows what a narrow escape they all had of being poisoned. Our ship now resembled an hospital. The poisoned patients were still in a deplorable situation. They continued to have gripes and acute pains in all their bones. In the daytime, they were in a manner giddy and felt a great heaviness in their heads. At night, as soon as they were warm in bed, their pains redoubled, and robbed them actually of sleep. The skin peeled off from the whole body, and pimples appeared on their hands. Those who were less affected with pains were much weaker in proportion, and crawled about the decks emaciated to mere shadows. We had not one lieutenant able to do duty, and as one of the mates and several of the midshipmen were likewise ill, the watches were commanded by the gunner and the other mates. One would think that so severe a visitation would have called for more than a mere note of passing sickness. It may be judged from Forster's journal with how much heart 
the people, including even the scientific men on board, endured these privations and suffered this hardness. We can see the captain, his face set southwards, looking over the heads of the hungry and discontented crew. He is thinking how he can break through the wall of ice and learn what is beyond. They are wondering how long it will be before the captain will give up this foolishness and turn back to warmer climates. The officers and passengers shared, as Forster plainly tells us, in the general dejection. Their store of special provisions had long since vanished, and they were now reduced to the fare of the common sailors. The hope of meeting with new lands had vanished, the topics of common conversation were exhausted, the cruise to the south could not present anything new, but appeared in all its chilling horrors before us. The conversation and opinions of Columbus's crew have only partly been preserved, but such as they were, such were those of Cook's officers and scientific passengers. They were ready to exchange all their chances of glory in the discovery of the Terra Australis Incognita for another month at Otaheite among the fruits and the blooming beauties of that island. Many other instances will be found by him who reads not only the voyages themselves, but also the books which belong to them and surround them, as the big fish is attended by the little fish. Always it is the same thing. The captain endures and murmurs not, the men endure and grumble. As one makes his way through these volumes, a personal interest, as I have already said, is presently awakened in the officers. Some of them begin to stand out clear of outline. We see their faces. We hear their voices. Among these is Captain Clark, he who follows at Cook's heels in the discovery. He is a silent shade and pensive. He carries out instructions and endures hardships, uncomplaining, even though, perhaps because, the hand of death is upon him. When his chief is killed, he is carried already in the last stage of consumption on board the Resolution to die in a few more weeks. Another who stands out a clear and well-defined figure is that of Anderson the surgeon, who picked up the language everywhere, compiled the vocabularies, and wrote these admirable reports on the manners and customs of the people, one of the earliest and best of anthropologists. Next to the captain, the man most zealous and eager for the success of the expedition. He died before his chief. Then comes King, who wrote the conclusion of the journal, King whom the natives loved and called Tinny, a man of genial and winning manners, a favorite with all. He came home in command of the discovery. They made him a post-captain. But four years after his return he died in the south of France. Then there is Gore, who succeeded Clark in the command. We see a good deal of Gore. He is always going off with boats, sounding, surveying, examining, a capable officer, but apparently, since King wrote the journals, not gifted with the pen of the ready writer. He died in 1790, one of the captains of Greenwich Hospital. There are also those stout fellows, Roberts, the first lieutenant, Phillips, who behaved with so much pluck at the murder of the captain, Samuel, the surgeon, Edgecombe, the marine. There are the two Forsters, grumbling and discontented, the amiable youth, Sidney Parkinson, draftsman, who died, Monkhouse, the surgeon, who died, Charles Green, the astronomer, who died, Sparman, the naturalist, whom we remember emerging from the bush where the natives had stripped him of everything but his spectacles. As for Gilbert, from whose log I have quoted, he is a voice and nothing more. He was transferred from one ship to the other. On his return home he was promoted with the rest, but, as I have said already, he died shortly afterwards of smallpox. I have mentioned Isaac Smith, the boy whom Cook took with him, his wife's cousin, midshipman on his first, and mate on his second voyage. After his second voyage he was made lieutenant, and continued in active service till the year 1794 when his health gave way and he retired, receiving the rank of admiral in the year 1804. He was the first Englishman who landed in Australia. 
When the captain went ashore, he took the boy with him. Now then, Isaac, he said, you go first. And the lad jumped ashore. Admiral Smith, after his retirement, lived with his cousin, the widow. There are one or two of the crew who deserve mention. The old and faithful Watman who followed Cook on the third voyage, never weary of the sea, has already been mentioned. It was an ill service that he did his master in dying at the juncture when the natives were trying to believe the strangers to be all gods and superior to death. Next there is Corporal Ledyard, the gallant marine who next to Anderson developed the greatest quickness in learning the language wherever they touched. He was by birth an American, and in the year 1786 he formed the project of walking across the continent of America. For that purpose he thought he would journey through Europe and across Siberia to Kamchatka, where their Russian friends of their last visit would perhaps take him across the Straits. Sir Joseph Banks and others raised a sum of fifty pounds for him. With this slender provision he sailed to Hamburg, and thence to Copenhagen and Stockholm. He thought to find the Gulf of Bothnia frozen over. As it was not, he walked all round it through Tornia to St. Petersburg. Here he found a convoy of military stores about to start for the use of one Billings, who had been in one of Cook's expeditions, and had now taken service with the Russians, being employed in making surveys for the Russian government on the northwest coast of America. He obtained permission to join this convoy, and in August reached the town of Irkutsk in Siberia. Thence he proceeded to Yakutsk, where he met with Captain Billings. He returned to Irkutsk, intending to pass the winter there. But in January he was arrested, brought back under the guard of an officer and two soldiers in a post sledge from Moscow. He was then taken to the frontier and dismissed, with the Empress's prohibition ever to set foot within her territories. What harm this poor soldier-sailor could possibly do to the Empire of Russia is not apparent. Sir Joseph Banks heard from him from Königsberg. He died in 1790, and his adventurous life has been written and may be read. One feels a certain sympathy, too, with the Irishman who had been in the Danish service and somehow seemed to have no country left, so that when he ran away with the intention of remaining away for the rest of his life, a general compunction was felt for him, and though he was brought back, his punishment was no more than a fortnight in irons. Many tried to run away. A sailor in New Zealand, enticed from his duty by a girl, a midshipman and a sailor in Otaheite, thinking that life on such an island was better far than to go on ploughing the barren wave, they were caught too, but not severely punished. Cook was hard, but he could feel for those weaknesses of human nature which did not interfere with the proper discharge of work. Lastly, two men ran away with a six-oared gig, but this was off Macau. They were never heard of again. One pictures the reception which these misguided and unhappy sailors would meet with from the Chinese mariners who should chance upon them and their six-oared gig. One more reminiscence of the voyages. It is Christmas Day. The ship is in latitude 65 degrees south. It is midsummer, so the nights are short. But the skies and seas are hidden with continual fog, so that nothing can be seen around or above. The vessel is in the midst of ice. A wall of ice is before them, broken ice, floating ice, ice in small lumps and in great hills all about them. For months the crew have been saving up their brandy in readiness for this sacred day, which they keep by all getting drunk, very drunk, says the historian, though the captain passes over the occurrence. On the discipline of the ship a good deal might be said, but Cook must not be judged by the practice of modern days. The sailors get drunk unrebuked on Christmas Day. That would not be permitted in these days. When the ship was in port, things were allowed to go on board which can hardly now be related. They may be found in great detail in Forster's book. At sea, a stern rule prevailed, and the lash was freely used. On shore and in port, the men did what they pleased. Those who know who went down on board the Royal George with brave Kempenfeldt will understand that Cook followed the usual practice. 
Certain things, he said, I permitted because I could not prevent them. There might have been, one feels, some restrictions, an attempt at restraint, but there were none. It was exactly the same with Wallace. One more point of difference. I know not when every ship began to carry its chaplain, but there was no chaplain on any of Cook's voyages. It was, however, the custom for the captain to read the service to the whole crew on Sunday mornings. The Bible from which Cook read the lessons during his last voyages was given to his widow, who used no other during the rest of her long life. It is a well-bound quarto, edition basket Oxford, 1765, and is now in Sydney with other relics of the great navigator. End of section 24chapter fourteen the last it seems idle to add anything concerning the character of james cook to what has gone before he was hard to endure true to carry out his mission perfectly loyal and single-minded he was fearless he was hot-tempered and impatient he was self-reliant he asked none of his subordinates for help or for advice he was temperate strong and of simple tastes he was born to a hard life, and he never murmured, however hard things proved. And like all men born to be great, when he began to rise, with each step he assumed, as if it belonged to him, the dignity of his new rank. A plain man, those who knew him say, but of good manners. If this volume does not show the manner of the man, then it has failed. Such as his achievements required, such he was. Let us, however, once more repeat briefly what those achievements were, because they were so great and splendid, and because no other sailor has ever so greatly enlarged the borders of the earth. He discovered the Society Islands. He proved New Zealand to be two islands, and he surveyed its coasts. He followed the unknown coast of New Holland for two thousand miles, and proved that it was separated from New Guinea. He traversed the Antarctic Ocean on three successive voyages, sailing completely round the globe in its high latitudes, and proving that the dream of the great southern continent had no foundation unless it was close around the pole and so beyond the reach of ships. He discovered and explored a great part of the coast of New Caledonia, the largest island in the South Pacific next to New Zealand. He found the desolate island of Georgia and Sandwich Land, the southernmost land yet known. He discovered the fair and fertile archipelago called the Sandwich Islands. He explored 3,500 miles of the North American coast, and he traversed the icy seas of the North Pacific, as he had done in the South, in search of the passage which he failed to discover. All this without counting the small islands which he found scattered about the Pacific. Again, he not only proved the existence of these islands, but he was in advance of his age in the observations and the minute examination which he made into the religion, manners, customs, arts, and language of the natives wherever he went. It was he who directed these inquiries, and he was himself the principal observer. When astronomical observations had to be made, it was he who acted as principal astronomer. He was as much awake to the importance of botany, especially of medicinal plants, as he was to the laying down of a correct chart. It is certain that there was not in the whole of the king's navy any officer who could compare with Cook in breadth and depth of knowledge, in forethought, in the power of conceiving great designs, and in courage and pertinacity in carrying them through. Let us always think of the captain growing only more cheerful as his ship forced her way southwards, though his men lay half-starved and half-poisoned on the deck. His voyages would have been impossible, his discoveries could not have been made, but for that invaluable discovery of his whereby scurvy was kept off and the men enabled to remain at sea long months without a change. I have called attention to the brief mention he makes of privation and hardships, he barely notes the accident by which half his company was poisoned by fish. He says nothing about the men's discomforts when their biscuit was rotten. These things, you see, are not scurvy. One may go hungry for a while, but recover when food is found, and is none the worse. 
one gets sick of salt junk, but if scurvy is averted, mere disgust is not worth observation. To drive off scurvy, to keep it off, was the greatest boon that any man could confer upon sailors. Cook has the honor and glory of finding out the way to avert this scourge. Those who have read of this horrible disease, the tortures it entailed, the terror it was on all long voyages, will understand how great should be the gratitude of the country to this man. Since the disease fell chiefly upon the men before the mast, it was fitting that one who had also in his youth run up the rigging to the music of the boatswain's pipe should discover that way and confer that boon. The gratitude of Cook's country was shown in several ways, all rather curious. Had he been a member of a noble family, his son would certainly have been raised to the peerage. As he was not, the king granted his family a coat of arms. I think that this must have been the last occasion when a coat of arms was granted as a recognition of service. In these days, if a man wants a coat of arms, he gets someone who understands heraldry to draw him one, or to find him one, or perhaps he ignorantly tries to make one for himself. A coat of arms, such a grant seems now to mean nothing. We think we can confer gentility upon ourselves, as indeed for all practical purposes we can, but not of the ancient kind. The old notion that gentility can be conferred by the sovereign as the fountain of honor is clean forgotten, but it was not then forgotten. No man could make himself armiger. Cook's family, therefore, was rewarded with his shield. They were advanced to the first step of nobility. The shield is thus described. Azure, between the two polar stars, or a sphere on the plain of the meridian, showing the Pacific Ocean, his track thereon marked by red lines. And for crest, on a wreath of the colors, is an arm bowed in the uniform of a captain of the Royal Navy. In the hand is the Union Jack on a staff proper. The arm is encircled by a wreath of palm and laurel. A very noble shield indeed. A pension of two hundred pounds a year was bestowed upon the widow, and the government further bestowed upon her half the profits arising from the publication of her husband's journal of the third voyage. She also received a share in the profits of the journal of the second voyage, but in both cases the interest alone was to be hers for life, the children to receive the principal after her death. At their death the principal was paid to her. Mrs. Cook was thus left fully provided for. It only remains to tell the story of the fate which fell upon Cook's children as well as upon himself. There were six children in all. Three died in infancy or in tender years. Three grew up to manhood. Of these, the eldest, James, was in the Navy. The second, Nathaniel, also went into the Navy. The third and youngest, Hugh, was sent to Cambridge, where he entered at Christ's College in the year 1793. The news of her husband's death reached the unhappy widow in the first week of October 1780. In the same week, her second son, Nathaniel, went down on board the Thunderer in a hurricane off Jamaica. The news reached her before the end of the year. Then followed a period of thirteen years, during which she saw her eldest son from time to time, a gallant and active officer, always on service, and educated the youngest boy, Hugh. In July 1793, this son, as I have said, was entered as a pensioner at Christ's, and went into residence in October. Two months later, he was attacked by scarlet fever, and died on December 21st in his eighteenth year. A portrait of this unfortunate youth in the possession of Canon Bennett shows a face of very remarkable beauty and delicacy, with none of the severity which belonged to that of his father. Only five weeks later, another blow fell upon the hapless woman, already bereaved of husband and five out of her six children. Her eldest son, who had been in the autumn of 1793, promoted to the rank of commander, was, while with his ship at Poole in Dorsetshire, appointed to the command of the Spitfire, sloop of war. On January 24th, 1794, he received from Captain Yeo, commanding officer of the station, 
his letters and orders to take command without delay he started immediately in an open boat manned by sailors returning from leave to sail from Poole to portsmouth it was in the afternoon his boat was rather crowded there was a strong ebb tide and a fresh wind it was growing dark this was the last scene of james cook the younger for he never reached his ship what happened will never now be known his body with a wound on the head and stripped of all his money and valuables was found on the beach at the back of the isle of wight the boat was also found broken up but no trace of any of the crew was discovered perhaps they were drowned perhaps they murdered the captain made for the island laid his body on the beach broke up the boat and dispersed the body was brought over to portsmouth and taken to cambridge where it was laid in the same grave with the remains of his brother hugh overwhelmed by this final blow the unhappy woman was prostrated with an illness of mind and body which kept her to her house for two years when she recovered she asked her cousin admiral isaac smith who was unmarried to live with her they took a home together at clapham where she continued to live until her death in eighteen thirty five being then ninety-three years of age by her own request she was buried with her two sons in the centre aisle of st andrew's church cambridge she kept her faculties to the end my informant describes her as a handsome and venerable lady her white hair rolled back in ancient fashion always dressed in black satin with an oval face an aquiline nose and a good mouth she wore a ring with her husband's hair in it and she entertained the highest respect for his memory measuring everything by his standard of honour and morality her keenest expression of disapprobation was that mr cook to her he was always mr cook not captain would never have done so like many widows of sailors she could never sleep in high wind for thinking of the men at sea and she kept four days in the year of solemn fasting during which she came not out of her own room they were the days of her bereavements the days when she lost her husband and her three boys she passed those days in prayer and meditation with her husband's bible and for her husband's sake she befriended their nephews and grandnephews and nieces and grandnieces of his whom she never saw they were not suffered to want with her pension and her share of the profits of the books and with other things such as the inheritance of her sailor son's fortune sworn under five thousand pounds mrs cook became a wealthy woman her house was good and filled with old furniture of the style called louis quinze it was also crowded and crammed in every room with relics curiosities drawings maps and collections brought home from the voyages it would seem that the government gave back the drawings and charts after they had been published on thursdays she always entertained her friends to dinner which was served at three o'clock after the death of her cousin the admiral she was taken care of by a faithful old servant whom she remembered in her will and by younger members of her own family footnote for these personal recollections of mrs cook and also for various documents connected with her husband's domestic life i am indebted to canon bennett of maddington vicarage devises as he is probably the only survivor of her personal friends this information could not have been procured from any one else without it the history of cook's private life would have been indeed shadowy End footnote. the greater part of the relics preserved were sent to the colonial government museum sydney after the colonial exhibition but the log of the first voyage and the gold medal conferred on the captain by the royal society are in the british museum the following genealogy shows the numbers and the end of cook's family all as has been seen were cut off in youth or infancy and no descendant now survives of england's greatest navigator james cook married elizabeth bates born 1742 died 1835 james born 1763 died 1794 nathaniel born 1764 died 1780 hugh born 1776 died 1793 elizabeth born 1766 died 1771 
Joseph, born and died, 1768. George, born and died, 1772. The End End of Section 25 End of Captain Cook by Walter Besant